Dieu l'a fait. So tonight we we're welcoming Bill Janeway. Um, he's the author of a book which is now in its second edition. So the second edition is this one. And the book played quite a role in the history of the family, by the way, because I read it when it was, uh, I learned about the book in a TechCrunch article, I think in 2012, bought it, read it, and then reached out to Bill. And we connected because you're quite often in Paris, notably to visit the OECD, uh, so an organization for which one of you works <laughs> now. And that is not, Uh, so well known by people here in Paris, but it's actually in Paris and it's a very good opportunity to attract uh, scholars and experts and policy makers from all over the world, including uh, Bill. And so tonight we will have a, a fire chat, chat, so an informal conversation. Um, then I invite you to uh, ask questions to Bill if you have some and then we can stay a bit longer. So maybe some of you have already the book, then you can have it signed by the author. Uh, if you don't have one, there are flyers um, uh, supplied by Cambridge University Press with which you can buy the book with a discount online. And um, that's about it. So thank you again for being here. And let me turn to, to Bill um, for a first question, which is, um, So I, I wanted to frame the discussion um, in the following way. Here in France, we like simple categories. And so here you're either a capitalist, which suggests right-wing, conservative views, supply-side economics, and anti-state positions, or you're a statist, and then you're against um, business, mm. you, uh, you, you fear the excess of capitalism, and so on. And Uh, in a way, you happen to be both. You're both a capitalist and a statist. And it, this is mostly the result of in, a very interesting life, uh, I guess. Uh, and so maybe you, you should start by explaining how you came to writing such a book based on both your academic background, uh, your, uh, your background as a Keynesian economist, but you're also a venture capitalist with quite an impressive track record. So tell us about that. That's a good question. Um, and it's, it actually takes me back, it takes me back to the generation before I was born. Because I grew up in a world that once upon a time was not that unusual in the United States. Um, it was a world in which the membrane between Wall Street and Washington between Main Street and Washington, the membrane was much more porous. That was a function of the Great Depression and World War II. And there were a number of people who moved back and forth across that frontier. Um, my parents were, in their very different ways, public intellectuals who were deeply engaged with the circle of intellectuals around the late New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Uh, my father was actually, at the age of 25, business editor of Time Magazine and became an editor of Fortune. Uh, and my brother and I, my late brother, uh, grew up in this kind of complex world where, for example, the founder of the firm, which was my, became my home when I went on my 35-year sabbatical from academia and met my wife, who was a chemical analyst of the first mutual fund, unit trust, chemical fund to reach a billion dollar in assets and invest exclusively in science-based industries. The founder of that firm was a very successful capitalist who had actually managed the war economy mobilization in the United States in the 1940s. So I kind of grew up on this cusp, this intersection of economics, politics, markets, political process. I wrote my PhD thesis, uh, as it happens for Richard Kahn, Keynes's number one student at Cambridge, on economic policy in Britain in the break from the 1920s into the Great Depression. So again, it was about this intersection of politics and economics and the spillovers 
between the two. So for me, it was what seemed so odd uh, was perfectly natural. And when I came to consider, to reflect on what I'd spent 30 years doing in the trenches as a venture capitalist, I realized that I and the entrepreneurs that I was backing, my peers and friends and colleagues across the venture capital universe and the entrepreneurs they were backing, both in the world of information technology and in the world of biotechnology, that we were all dancing on a platform that had been constructed by the United States government. You know, Obama got into a lot of trouble for saying, you didn't build that. We didn't build that platform. DARPA built that platform. The National Institutes of Health built that platform. And then finally, and this closes the loop, I was liberated to be able to go back to academia because between 1995 and 2000, Wall Street financial speculators generated one of the great productive bubbles, at least as equal in scale to the bubble that financed the construction of the railways in the first half of the 19th century and electrification in the 1920s, they took what we were doing in leveraging, building on top of that platform and decided it was worth between five and 10 times more than any sustainable value. And because I'd written my PhD thesis on 1929, I'd seen the movie before and we liquidated my portfolio, but it closed the loop between the state, the, mar the financial speculators, and the market economy that was transformed by that collaboration. So in a sense, the, f the first edition of the book was a kind of celebration of this extraordinary constructive collaboration in what I, I call a three-player game, which like the three-body problem in physics, is absolutely indeterminate. It is unstable, it is fragile, it is indeterminate. The second edition was motivated by several factors which combined... Just use the mic, otherwise... Okay, you can hear me now. Which, the several factors which, which combined, as I say, to, to reconfigure this three-player game and project us to living and working on the dark side. And we can go into that motivation in greater depth, if you well, like. Yes, maybe. So uh, the reason why I liked the book so much when I read the first edition was it was the first book, to my knowledge, who crossed the two very different topics of venture capital and financing startups and institutional, um, uh, the institutional conversation about what kind of state intervention yeah. do we need, what kind of I don't know, what first stage should we, should we build to make uh, to, so that the, the, economy, the economy is more sustainable? Right. And it was a first for me, so I'm sure a lot of people have written about that, but from, with your background as, as a practitioner of venture capital, uh, you were the first, to my knowledge, to explore those topics. And so, um, and it's a topic that, in a way, has emerged as very important in, in the last five years. Yeah. Because p many people have realized that why did they're bringing a lot of good tech companies also disrupt many, th many things that used to make it possible for us to live together in a sustainable and inclusive way. So why the second edition? I guess a lot of yeah. that has, has well, changed from your point of view. The, 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 the most profound and strategic motivation was a kind of double recognition over the last five years. And frankly, before the political events of 2016, and since we live back and forth between old Cambridge, England, and New York City, we've got events on both sides uh, that punctuated what I'm just going to say. Um, the most profound motivation came out of the realization that the digital revolution, sponsored, supported, fostered by the mission-driven American state through the Cold War, had generated, thanks to its amplification 
in the great bubble by financial speculators, had taken on a life of its own. It had not only outgrown any need for subsidy and support, it was attacking the authority of the state, not just the American state, at multiple levels, and actually going beyond that, and this was in the context of Brexit and the presidential election in the United States, it was undermining the integrity of the political process on which the authority of the state ultimately relies. So that was the, the profound motivation that said, I must go back and chew this cabbage again. Indeed, recognize that as the digital revolution, the economic and social consequences of the digital revolution were proving so disruptive in micro markets for transportation and accommodation across the world, thanks to Uber and Airbnb, and I know something about their impact in Paris. Um, but also, and this is, I know, of keen interest to you, Nicola, transforming the labor market. R management of work by algorithm, whether conducted by Uber or conducted by Walmart, creates and has created stresses at a time when, in the United States, for sure, substantially in Britain, perhaps to a lesser extent on the continent, governments, states, have abdicated responsibility for dealing with the consequences of the digital revolution they sponsored. Now, the notion that technological revolutions would have political consequences, you only have to go back to the impact of the Industrial Revolution in Britain, which led to the Chartists, which led to the opening up of the political process and civil service reform over 50 years and ended the rule of old corruption as the British establishment was known circa 1800, or the end of the 19th century when the railroads and Wall Street drove that wave of populist rebellion that peaked in 1896 with William Jennings Bryan and his proclamation that thou shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. This transformation, I was asked, I was actually spent the afternoon, spent four hours at the OECD today, and one question came, well, is there a sort of pendulum where, you know, you go from an empowered state to a market takes all? And I said, I don't think it's a pendulum because you never get back to the same place. In fact, better to think of it, perhaps in Paris especially, as a dialectic. And we have moved to a world in which, compared with the 1920s, the public sector is on the order of 35 to 50 percent of every developed country's national economy. It was 5 to 15 percent in 1929. We're not back, neoliberalism is not the old liberalism of the 1920s. But the challenge to states, to governments, to political processes, it is very important to remember, and Paris is one place where that memory should be ripe, that the coexistence of market capitalism and representative democracy is relatively recent and historically fragile. And that's why, and this is the other, the final motivation, reckoning that China has been in the process of going from being the most effective follower nation in the 250 year history of technological development to challenging for leadership at the frontier with a very different model. I call it the, the three player game with Chinese characteristics. That in also invited revisiting the subject matter of the first edition. Uh, and from the point of view of the US, UK, the Anglo-American world suggests a further kind of reinforcement of the shadows that have been creeping over us. So a lot of, a lot of things have been changing. So China emerging as a, an economic power at the frontier, um, the labor market disrupted in Western countries, 
populism on the rise. Uh, there are a lot of questions asked here in Europe about all that. And wh one of the questions is maybe we can choose a third way between the US uh, and China. And the fact that you can succeed at the frontier in those two very different ways. So the, yeah. uh, the US with the, the, the primary role of the market and China with the state being very much involved uh, suggest th that maybe Europe has a card to play or something new to invent. Do, do you see um, signs of that happening or do you have ideas that could be inspire European leaders? Well, perhaps um, relatively rarely amongst Anglo-American economists. Uh, I think that there actually is, that it exists and it's demonstrated its value uh, a third way. It's the German ordo liberalismus. Now, I'm one of the, I spent many, many pages, many, much argument in um, decrying the German drive to austerity as soon as possible after the global financial crisis had frozen the market economies across the world. But standing back and taking a longer look, and this is particularly informed by remarkable work that I think you're aware of, Nicola, that was produced by Marcus Brunemeyer and Harold James of Princeton and Jean-Pierre Landau, Landau um, on the Euro crisis, framing the Euro crisis, coming out of the most appalling 30 years that any developed nation has suffered and maybe the worst that any nation has suffered since the Peace of Westphalia, the Germans did construct a, an alternative model to the Anglo-American open market plus state executive with discretion and authority and access to finance to respond and offset and balance the inevitable cushioning uh, uh, crises of the market economy. Germans said, we are never giving the executive that kind of autonomy again. And particularly, we're going to limit the executive's access to capital, to finance. But in return, we're going to have a market economy that is much more resilient, has much deeper support under it. And you know, in 2009, 10, 11, 12, the German economy actually survived uh, quite well from what was a disaster for, I mean, a relative disaster, not the disaster of 1932-33, for most of the rest of the developed world. So I think taking that seriously, reckoning, and this is the other side of it, and this I write about a lot in both editions of the book. How many, how many of you here have economics degrees? We have some. We have a full. Well, in the core of both pre and neoclassical economics is in the economics of welfare is the notion that market failures, particularly externalities that are positive because the returns are to greater to society than to private investors, or negative. Pri a positive externality is a lighthouse. There's a role for government in providing lighthouses. Negative externalities are pollution. There's a role for government in pu uh, punishing polluters, inducing them to behave better. Well, it turns out, when you really go back and look at it, market failure has failed to legitimize much of what we've seen in the way of constructive state intervention, particularly with respect with respect to innovation, particularly in the Anglo-American world. Now, France does have two political traditions of its own. Uh, Louis XIV and Napoleon, they're not exactly antagonistic with each other. And going back to Colbert, there's always been a role, a distinctive role for the state in public investment for one good or another, however broadly distributed the benefits are. But in the US, for sure, what we've seen has, that has been required is a political, le, politically legitimate mission which justifies suspending 
cost-benefit analysis, where when you're thinking about long-term forward investments, it's always easier to evaluate the costs than to evaluate the benefits. It's, whether it's in a giant corporation or whether it's in the, the green eye shades in the Treasury scrutinizing budget requests, the net present value of the most imaginative and creative and potentially significant investments will always compare badly against the most simple, straightforward, just keep doing what you're doing kind of activities. So whether it's national development, as it was in the 19th century, or national security, whenever you hear the words war, the word war applied to economic policy, it says that someone in the United States in 1972, it was President Richard Nixon, is saying when he declared war on cancer, cost-benefit analysis doesn't apply. We are going to invest à outrance, and we are going to, you know, in his, he said, of course, having no idea of how absurd the proposition was, we're going to cure cancer in a generation. But it's that aspect, the mission-driven state, which has been delegitimized in the United States. And while the digital revolution and the financial speculators who are financing the unicorns, who are speculating in Bitcoin and blockchain and cryptocurrencies, while they're funding further experiments in what to do with the digital technologies, the next new economy, if it's constructed at all, the green economy, the low carbon economy, is going to be constructed without the United States. Okay, because in your view, let me confirm that you, there's the digital economy, which is the result of the last technological revolution, and we should prepare the next, in a way, which, which should lead us into a greener economy. And there's, and there's a big difference, mm. because had it not been for the Cold War, if the U.S. government had returned to its stance of the pre-war era, when total federal spending on research was A, trivial, and B, primarily devoted to agriculture uh, under a mandate established by President Abraham Lincoln in 1862, uh, if the U.S. had reverted to that, we would have had a digital evolution. It would have taken much longer, it would have been much more haphazard, but in 1945, IBM and AT&T were playing with replacing what the British called valves and we call vacuum tubes with, AT&T would have invented the transistor. This would have played out. The problem today is that notwithstanding the White House and the US Department of Energy and the US Environmental Protection Agency, global warming isn't gonna wait. There's a forcing factor here at work and that's why seeing the U.S. abdicate, abandon the, the, the Paris Protocol, delegitimize the term climate change from any government publication is beyond frustrating. And of course, on the other hand, China is now by far the leader in research investment in the green technologies, which are still immature, I mean, particularly energy storage for dealing with, for making grid compatible in terms of cost per kilowatt hour, grid compliant from intermittent energy sources like solar and wind. But you mentioned Germany, so if the US is absent from those new wars that we should wage in order to fuel uh, innovation, does, does Europe or Germany or France have the firepower to, to wage such a war, well, if not the political uh, will? There, there, well, the political will is what comes first. <laughs> um, first of all, I would say, I mean, there's some hopeful signs. Sitting in Cambridge, which is, I think it's fair to say, the leading science and technology university in Europe, it's clear that the ERC, in, 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 from the EU community is funding more risk-seeking, more speculative, uh, higher 
potential, potential impact than certainly the British Research Councils are, or the US National Science Foundation is, where there tends to be this um, pattern that we're going to give you money to demonstrate that what you've already done, you can do again, versus go out there and really experiment at the frontier. Um, so that's a good sign. The amounts of money compared to as proportions of collective national income you know, are pretty trivial. The ability to deploy at scale, we do see, I mean, clearly in transportation, one of my, one of my laws of, of, of innovation life is that an exclusive pursuit of efficiency is the enemy of innovation. Well, when we look at all of the investment going into high-speed rail, we know that efficiency in the allocation of resources is not the highest good in Spain, for example, um, where high-speed rails have, have been built all over the place. Um, but that kind of investment in a greener infrastructure is just not taking place in the US. It is taking place in Europe. That's a constructive goal. Now, you assembled will have a much clearer sense than I in the aftermath of the Italian elections, in the uh, somewhat unstable status of the renewed coalition in Berlin, and of course, perhaps most significantly, in the unusual outcome of your presidential process here in France, whether out of that comes a regrouped affirmation of a European purpose, I don't know. We don't really know either, actually. <laughs> but, <laughs> so, but maybe one thing that's missing is the, the world you mentioned at the beginning, the, that world in which people could go back and forth right. between the private sector and the public sector doesn't really exist anymore here. Uh, people are kind of trapped within the state apparatus or ha uh, have been leaving for good to join the private sector. Right. But when the connections are made, it's at a very high level, like President Macron uh, discussing with top executives mm -hmm. of the private sector. But there's not much done at, at the lower level. So, do you see a way for the entrepreneurial community, today's entrepreneurial community, to work with the state to try to rediscover the capacity to do things together? Right. Um, the two responses to that. Uh, one is um, we shouldn't get too romantic about the way the world was. There was an awful lot of reciprocal rent seeking going on between public and private sector 70 years ago. But second, and this is why it's so frustrating, and again, part of the motivation for the second edition. Under the Obama administration, initiatives were taken, and they were taken as a result of a catastrophic failure. The catastrophic failure was the launch of healthcare.gov, the website, the portal for the Affordable Care Act. But the portal and the Affordable Care Act were saved by one of the most remarkable entrepreneurial interventions for the public good by a team of absolute super, super techie geeks led by Mikey Dickerson, an amazing guy, who came and worked, you know, they, they slept under their desks, they worked 100 hour weeks for six weeks and they saved it and out of that came the creation of the US Digital Service mo modeled on what was transiently a real initiative under a Tory government in Britain uh, created by Mike Bracken called the Government Digital Service. And the notion was to bring into the public sector what had been learned in the private sector about enabling computers the computer systems, what the services that were provided, the digital services, to be transparent, to have easy, easy access, and a succession of 
chief technology officers and deputy chief technology officers in the Obama White House under the oversight of the Office of Science and Technology Policy really started to build out a kind of collaboration that we had not seen since the early glory days of DARPA, which was now 30 years in the past. Well, if you, if you would like, you know, we are on the side of the evidence-based community. There's a really appalling bit of evidence that is available to all of you on a um, Google portal at your disposal. If you type in the letters OSTP, you'll see come up OSTP.gov. That is the current website for the Office of Science and Technology Policy. But you'll also see OSTP.ObamaArchive, which is the state of the website on January 19th, 2017, when a very good friend of ours retired and resigned as Deputy Chief Technology Officer, the successor of Jen Palka, wife of Tim O'Reilly. These are inside references for a few of you who are not, nodding and smiling knowingly. Um, the, o the, the Obama OSTP website is extraordinarily deep. It has initiative after initiative, program after program, links across the public and private sector. The current website is not a website. It's one page. It is devoid of content. And that is where we are for the duration. It's telling a lot. So, um, so if the state is failing, as in the US, or half failing, like here in Europe, because we don't have the proper executives at the top with, with the right mindset, or even the, the knowledge of what could be achieved harnessing technology, uh, how can we tame the tech companies themselves so that they contribute to revigorating the state or right. even to, to do things without, without it? No, no question more profound and relevant. Well, certainly your commission, and it's a monopoly uh, uh, or anti-monopoly commissioner, uh, is active. Uh, the Commission also has, as you know better than I, you know in much more detail than I, a program on uh, the, in effect, the labor market consequences of the gig economy. None of that work is going on in the U.S. There are some endogenous market responses in the U.S. In certain cities, Uber drivers have been creating guilds to bargain collectively with Uber over terms and conditions. Uh, there's a lot of stories of Walmart employees creating networks of Facebook friends. Walmart, uh, Walmart actually last year uh, did raise its entry level from above the U.S. minimum wage, which hadn't changed in, what, 30 years, requiring if you were on minimum wage at Walmart, in order to be able to feed a couple, let alone a family, you had to take food stamps as well. Um, they raised it because the endogenous market response, people weren't cleaning the floor. They weren't restocking shelves. Walmart got the message, not from its employees, who of course have no union, they got the message from the customers who were telling them, I'm not coming here anymore, it's disgusting. So there are endogenous responses within the market economy, but if we rely on them, it's like relying on those market responses when Henry Ford had to raise wages, not because he wanted his workers to be able to buy cars, but because the turnover on the production line was so horrible, see the Charlie Chaplin movie, Modern Times, it was so horrible that turnover was about 140% a year. Nobody could stand it for more than about five or six months. Um, and then came the United Auto Workers. Um, so relying on endogenous market responses is going to be pretty frustrating. Formulating regulatory responses from those political processes that are functional, more difficult. We are seeing, again, we are seeing, in the U.S., we're seeing one sign of what appears to be beginning a nascent, effective 
invocation of the political process. It's the teachers, the school teachers, in the reddest of the red states going on strike. They have a union, but the union didn't start this. The teachers did. And in at least three states, the state legislature has actually responded by raising taxes and increasing wages after a long generation of saying education isn't a public good anymore, which is the most, the ultimate abdication of leadership that the U.S. could possibly adopt. So I think that there is room for experimentation across Europe in different countries. One would hope that there's an attitude of, gee, that seems to be working. Maybe we ought to try it. The great American Supreme Court Justice, Louis Brandeis, used to refer to our federal system as enabling the individual states to be, quote, laboratories of democracy. Well, maybe this loose confederation in Europe can benefit from experiments across different environments, different contexts, some of which at least might be generalizable. Maybe one last question. I know that we invited people from venture capital firms yep. because you, you used to be, or you still, in a way, you're still a senior advisor to Warburg Pincus. How do you see the state of venture capital today in general, maybe in Europe, if you know them? Yeah. And how do you see the future of venture capital well, and when, financing when, startups? When I came into that part of the game, it was a, uh, it was a craft. When the National Venture Capital Association was established in 1975, uh, all of the members, we'd have had some empty chairs in this room if all of the members were present. I'm not kidding. Um, even through the, in, in, in the early 1980s, there was the first, we thought it was a bubble. It, we thought it was the mountain of speculation. It was the foothills. But it pulled in new money, new people into the process. But there were two things that were the case then that are, let's say, different, substantially different today. First of all, there wasn't much money. Um, and second, however, there was out there for those entrepreneurs and their venture backers who could take an idea, turn it into a working project, build a business from that project and generate what my fellow I don't refer to in the book, he's much referred to, but I don't refer to him as my psychotic mentor. Um, and he was a great mentor and he was also nuts. Um, what he used to refer to as positive cash flow from operations. Corporate happiness equals positive cash flow from operations. What does that mean? It means that your customers are delivering more cash than what it costs you to deliver to them a product or a service. It means you are liberated from dependence on the vagaries, the availability or non-availability, the varying cost of external finance. And once you reach that, you could assume that a public offering into a liquid capital market, which would provide liquidity to your early investors and to your people, but would also create a currency for growing by acquisition as well as internally, that that would be available. Over the last 15 years, two things have happened. One, particularly the last 10 years. One, in the context of a zero to negative, real risk-free rate of interest, as the central banks have been the sole institutions with a mandate, a challenged mandate in Europe, to support the painfully slow recovery from the financial crisis, that, what an inducement for institutional investors to seek to buy risk and accept illiquidity in return for the hope of a positive return. That's the driving force for the unicorn bubble. Of course, it's combined with the more parochial FOMO, fear of missing out on the next Facebook. Uh, it's combined with, the, it creates the opportunity 
to suspend corporate happiness as positive cash flow and literally burn through billions of dollars with a problematic capacity for monetizing what you're doing with those dollars and turning it into positive cash flow. So that's one fact. There's just such an enormous amount more money. At every stage of the game in the US, angel investors provide the kind of capital and scale that was Series A venture 25 years ago. Venture guys provide what was the follow-on Series B, C. Institutions are providing the capital for a set, not all, a relatively modest set of consumer-oriented, where the total, the target uh, addressable market is measured in billions. For everybody else, for all other entrepreneurs, I think that in the world of, of computing and computing applications has come to resemble the biotech model much more. And that venture capitalists, intelligent, rational, thoughtful, historically aware venture capitalists, are providing an economic service. It's not the same one. It's funding distributed research and development for big companies. And the question for the entrepreneur and the venture financier at each stage, from plugging it in to see if it lights up, to getting a few customers who will testify that it works and it's valuable, the question is, do we sell now? Do we try to become the deep mind aqua hire of Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Apple, pick one, Facebook, pick one. Um, because the challenge of building a business to survivable, sustainable scale remains just as enormous as it always was without the access to the public capital and with the exposure, as is happening in the US, to real interest rates returning back towards normal levels. Does, uh does your mentor's uh, advice about corporate happiness still applies in, a, in an economy driven by increasing returns to scale? Well, you I know, mean, when you look around in all of these economies, all of our economies, you, you've, you keep stumbling on these really interesting companies that over the course of a decade or two have bootstrapped themselves into positions of real strong markets where they have been delivering, and this is, I'm, in, I'm an IT guy, they've been delivering software that provides services that makes it easier, cheaper, more efficient, more effective to provide, for example, logistics management to public schools, um, that physical facilities management, um, intermediating between mom and pop truckers, huge, still, and, and it's going to be a while before they're replaced, replaced by autonomous vehicles. Um, mom and pop truckers with the people who want a less than truckload delivery somewhere random across a big country. Um, these companies are available to, they're not going to become unicorns, but they do represent opportunities for investment and for supporting the growth of companies that are addressing demonstrable problems and of, of customers who have come to rely on them. And they tend to just be, just be on the point of realizing that how their customers use their stuff is information of extreme value in working out how to make their stuff more valuable to their customers. They're beginning to get the digital message. So that's a very exciting place to invest. And in Europe, I know these companies exist. One of my favorite, one of the most successful, now former venture investors at Warburg Pincus has just begun the process as an individual of becoming an angel investor in these kinds of companies in the UK. They exist in the UK, I promise you they exist in France. Well, they, they exist even here as part of the family because it's, because it's more difficult to raise capital here in Europe as right. compared to the US. Well, one of the advice we, get, we give entrepreneurs is if you can maximize cash flow early on. Absolutely. Well, and by the way, that means the market is telling you something really positive, mm -hmm. that what you're doing is worthwhile, Absolutely. right? It's one thing to convince, convince the guys who you know, have given Elon Musk 
about a quarter of what he would need to get to positive cash flow at Tesla. Forget about the rockets. Um, problem is, he needs another 20, 25 billion. It's gonna be challenging to raise that. But if your customers are actually paying you for what you're doing in amounts that exceed the cost of doing it, you've got a really good signal that it's worthwhile doing it. And you can attract investors. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can invite questions from you. I'm sure Absolutely. you have some, uh, including those I completely forgot to, to ask. Questions. Does someone have a question? A question? Oh, come now. Yes, you have a privileged position from which to ask it, my wife. The question was, or, or the, the, what was noted was that in the American newspapers today, it was, uh, an article was on the state of Massachusetts directly investing in a new wind farm 50 miles from Boston, 50 minutes from Boston, in an old quasi-abandoned port where it's also going to create jobs as well as deliver clean energy. Well, there's a long history here, very contested history in the United States, which has been renewed around the world of um, uh, broadband communications and now may be opened up in the world of uh, renewable energy. And that is the, the, the potential for public alternatives to private investment. There was a huge war in the United States that lasted for about 50 years over whether cities and states could legitimately build power plants and electricity grids and deliver the benefits of electricity versus without taking the profit out of what was a natural monopoly and conferring a franchise on a for-profit company. This war went back and forth. On the one hand, uh, a, a, an extraordinary American, nobody in this room will know his name, Gifford Pinchot. Gifford Pinchot was a pal of Teddy Roosevelt. He founded the National Park Service, and he became governor of Pennsylvania at a time when Philadelphia, Pennsylvania Power and Light was maximizing profits as a monopolist by charging very high prices and limiting the scale of its distribution. He proposed a project called Superpower, which was going to, in effect, nationalize at the state level the delivery of, of, of electricity. He was defeated by the mobilization in the 1920s, the mobilization of public opinion in favor of free, free markets, private profit, and 10 years later, in the context of the Great Depression, Roosevelt responded with the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was the largest public power project in American history. And across the country, you could find pockets, particularly, by the way, pockets of cities where there was a, a population that went back to the refugees from the revolutions of 1848 in states like Wisconsin and Minnesota, pockets of progressive state mobilization, uh, political forces. Um, so today, most recently, we've had some cities saying, well, if the cable companies, whose, after all, historic principal competitive advantage has been in acquiring monopoly franchises through knowing who to bribe in the town council, um, if they're not, and the telephone company, which we know has no interest, if they're not going to deliver real broadband, then we the city will. And there was a moment when Google said, we'll back cities to do that, and then they got the message, no, don't do it. So this is an area where the states as laboratories of economically effective democracy could play a really positive role. The, the footnote was that the co-investors in this technology venture in Massachusetts all come from Northern Europe. In 
Denmark, they're very, yeah. Inter yeah. very much into yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Uh, the, the, the question was uh, about Vivitech. I, I am affirmatively not here because of Vivitech. Uh, I'm kind of allergic to big conferences nowadays. <laughs> Uh, but the question was about, you know, the Vivitech, what part of its mission is to foster partnerships between startups and big companies? Um, my um, historical experience is that those partnerships are really, really challenging. My historical experience of corporate venture is don't take it. The corporate... So venture capital operated yeah. by large companies. Right. And there's a big increase in that. The big company is always going to have conflicted motivations in the investments it, make. it makes. The venture capitalist has the benefit, for good or ill, of a very pure motivation. It's what I call uh, Marx amended for the venture capital community. MCM prime. Money, in Marx's terms, money turns into commodities, which turns into more money. The venture capitalist case, money turns into companies, and which then turn into more money. But the corporation has a corporate development purpose. It has, let's get educated about the market. Let's see if this venture has got some ideas that we can feed back into our own uh, product development activities. And also, typically, and this is, this, is a, this is a challenge that I know the family is dedicated to addressing. In my experience, it's vanishingly rare to find a very rare species working for a big company. The rare species is a serially successful venture capitalist. Now here's the dirty secret after 37 years of data on professional venture capital in the United States. If you take the cross-section of all the venture capital funds that were ever founded, the number of those funds who are responsible for all of the excess performance relative to the public market index is minute. It's certainly less than 10% of the funds. It's more like 5% of the funds. Then, the second, the second stylized statistical fact, as we say, is that when you go to the time series rather than the cross-section, you observe in venture something that doesn't exist in any other financial asset class. Persistence in performance. Fund one of firm A contributes materially to predicting the performance of fund two. So what that says, it's not just a small number of funds, it's a small number of firms. And the people who are the investing partners in those firms tend to become very rich. And you know some of their names from John Doerr to Mark Andreessen. Now, from the point of view of, of the people who provide venture capitalists with money, this is a real problem. Because the people you want to invest in don't need your money. Now, Sequoia has changed the terms of that, and we're going to see what happens. Sequoia is one of the greatest venture capital firms ever. It's just gone through a phase change. It's gone from raising funds on the order first of 100 million, or 50 million to 100 million to 500 million, sort of con con continuous. They've now got something like 14 billion under management. You can't invest as a startup venture capitalist with 14 billion. Believe me, Warburg Pincus deploys that per fund, and that's why we don't do startups anymore. But Finding those individuals working for big companies reminds me of one of the sort of formative experiences I had very early on. Once upon a time, GE, when just when um, it was going through this phase change with its notorious, great, brilliant, destructive CEO, Jack Welch, who was the vehicle of convincing everyone that uh, maximizing shareholder value is the only role for management and then said that's the stupidest thing I ever heard five years after he retired as CEO after the financial crisis. Um, Jack Welch was confronted by the guy who was running 
the, um, Gen the General Electric venture company, Javenko, who had delivered a billion dollars of cash value to the corporation thanks to the mini bubble of 1982-3. And he said to Jack Welch, you know, if we were an independent venture firm, I and my partners would be sharing, before tax, $200 million. Welch's response was to say, there's a chemist in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, GE Plastics, whose patents earned a billion dollars for the company last year. He gets his, his salary and a bonus. What are you bitching about? So needless to say, Pedro Castillo and his team left GE, started Fairfield Ventures, Fairfield, Connecticut was where the headquarters were, and set about being good venture capitalists on their own. So the challenge of attracting and retaining the kind of talent, this rare talent inside a big company, very difficult. So they tend to be followers, they tend to be conflicted, and they tend, of course, the ultimate thing, at time of exit, they compromise the maximization of value because they're going to have an inside track and inevitably they'll scare off potential competitors for acquiring the business. So that leads me to another question related to large companies. A lot of people uh, think in France that we, we, so far we failed growing startups from the garage to uh, becoming large global companies, tech companies. So maybe the solution to France becoming a more, uh, more tech-driven nation lies in the incumbents. And so hence the passion for incumbents working with startups, yeah. that's Viva Tech, or the idea that maybe the incumbents can become tech companies themselves. Well, do there, what there, do you think of that? Is there a possibility of doing that? The, I, th I think it, it, it kind of cuts both ways. First of all, making it easier and more effective for big companies to absorb innovation from the outside and not strangle it, smother it, subject it to the HR rules and the procurement rules that have evolved painfully with bureaucratic practice over decades and generations. There are some companies who are getting, who are better than that. I have to say Google's probably the best at that, uh, that I'm aware of. But there's some really interesting work out of Duke University. There's a team at Duke University who have been studying absorption from the outside of big companies, of, of technology, of innovation from the outside. So that's a company by company. It's very culturally distinctive. Um, but it goes with saying, look, the game here is to be an effective, not an efficient, effective acquirer. Uh, you know, at Cisco, they say, and they were the, you know, built a business over a generation by acquisition, that if a third of the acquisitions actually worked, actually proved worthwhile, they thought they were doing great. But building a on-ramp for bringing in and not losing entrepreneurs from the outside, absorbing, perhaps protecting from the corporation their innovations, that's a way forward. It's a way forward for companies like Schneider. Um, I have to tell you my understanding is that Siemens has been terrible at this. Um, but it is an approach. And on the other side, I think, you know, I think digitalization of big companies is like electrification. You know, once upon a time, you could differentiate yourself because you knew how to use, plug it in electricity to take those, probably when this was building was first built, was first used for manufacturing, it had belts and pulleys that were taking power off a steam engine. We're a little far from the river, it couldn't have been water. Um, but those, those belts and pulleys lasted from the water wheel powered mills through the steam powered mills to the first generation of electricity powered mills where you just pulled out the steam engine and put in an electrical generator and a motor and still ran the factory the same way. That meant if you wanted to change your manufacturing process, you had to tear down the building. Once you had unit drive motors and the electricity grid delivering power to the wall, you could change 
the manufacturing process just by moving the machine tools around. And that's when manufacturing productivity exploded, actually, for those companies that survived the Great Depression. So every company that survives, just like every company became an electricity company, every company is going to be a digital company or it's not going to survive. Maybe one or two other questions? The question was, what, what aspect of uh, inherited economics has been burned by my experience? Um, it, and, and the neoclassical production function, which was constructed by Bob Solo and extended by now three generations of economists to define how capital, labor, and something else, quote, technology, are combined efficiently to produce under competitive conditions output in such a mode, and this is absolutely crucial because it liquidated until Thomas Piketty and his colleagues across the world to including the guys at Berkeley and Stanford, um, until Piketty provided, it li eliminated distribution as a subject of economics because it is very easy to prove and every first year econ economics student does it that under those conditions, the factors of production, labor and capital, will earn the marginal product. That is, they will earn in wages and in returns to capital their contribution to final output. What could be more fair than that, right? Well, Piketty pointed out that that's actually not how distribution of income and wealth that we observe. The extension of the neoclassical production function into what is usually referred to as new growth theory, which incorporates innovation, and then has been particularly formalized by Philippe Aguillon, for whom I have enormous regard, he's a good friend, into Schumpeterian growth theory. As he hasn't actually written, but I think he would agree that its entire focus is on how entrepreneurs will compete to have the opportunity to deliver as a monopoly for a time a necessary intermediate good to the producers of a final good that is produced under perfect competition and which is always in full demand. What that means in simple terms that any entrepreneur should understand is yes, there's some technical risk. Is your invention going or your investment going to yield the best next intermediate product. But guess what? There is no conception of market risk. It is assumed that if you produce the best hamburger sandwich, there will be an infinite demand for all of the hamburgers you can produce. The experience of mine, the experience of every venture capitalist I know, is that actually, since you always want to start far enough down the curve from the lab, biotech is separate. In IT, you want to start far enough down the curve that the challenge is commercialization for a market that you hope exists, but market risk is more significant than technology risk, and there's no provision for that in neoclassical growth theory. It is a huge challenge and a really necessary one, and I'm hopeful that it will be addressed.